Thanks for joining us for our intern to employee session. I hope you were able to join our sessions earlier today and learn a little bit more about what our Dolby Atmos technology is and how it's used in the industry. And now that we've gone over what the technology is, we want to touch on how you can be a part of all of this as an intern or an early career hire. So for this session, we'll be having a Q&A focused on becoming an employee at Dolby, specifically working with our Dolby Atmos sound technology. And that being said, if you have any questions, please feel free to put those questions in the chat, and I will be feeding them to Nick and Alan here. So to start off, I'll introduce myself. My name is Amy Lee, and I am an associate recruiter working with the university relations team. I will be moderating this Q&A, but before we start, I will have Nick and Alan introduce themselves, what their role is, and a brief description of the team that they're working on. So Alan, can I have you start us off? Thanks. Uh, my name is Alan Seafeld. Uh, I'm part of the audio research team uh, here at Dolby, uh, working in our San Francisco office. Um, I've been at the company for quite a while, uh, almost 18 years now. Um, and uh, I work on a team, it's um, actually a, a very globally distributed team. We have audio research researchers all over, uh, an office in San Francisco, office in Sydney, uh, Beijing, Stockholm, Barcelona. Um, I feel like I'm probably leaving one of them out. Uh, but a very collaborative group uh, working across the globe on a wide variety of really interesting um, audio related technologies. So um, our group, uh, it's part of the advanced technology group and we are really tasked with um, you know, inventing th the new core technologies that will drive future business for Dolby. So um, you know, the you know, kind of the core, uh, the core of Dolby Atmos uh, originated inside of this group, uh, as well as uh, numerous other uh, technological advancements from the past. And then, you know, we work quite closely with uh, with other departments within Dolby uh, to try to take those core technologies and, and turn them into real products that finally uh, make it into the uh, hands of uh, content creators, uh, uh, consumers, and our uh, professional partners. So I will uh, leave it at that. Thank you. Nick? Hi, everybody. My name is Nick Biangle. Um, I'm a manager in the OS Platforms Group um, here at Dolby Laboratories. I have been here for about 14 years. I keep trying to catch up to Alan, but I never make it. <laughs> and uh, we have, um, we focus in on Dolby Atmos, um, and we've been working with our partners, which are Microsoft and Apple, for the past, past four years or so. Um, we are mostly a San Francisco-based organization, although we do have some folks over in Rotsov, um, Poland as well, that we work with. And uh, my team's job is more on the integration side or the productization side, and it's our job to make sure that, um, you know, basically from the moment when you click on a Dolby Atmos movie in Netflix until the audio comes out over your headphones, that that whole system works the way that it's supposed to, and we're we're creating the absolutely best Dolby Atmos experience that we can for you. Great, thank you so much. To kick off this q and I have a question for the both of you. Um, so can you both give an example of the types of work that past and current interns have done on your team and how that work fits into the lar larger Dolby picture? Can I have Nick go ahead first? Of course, yeah. Um, so on my team, given that we're an integration team, Something that I have tried to do is to have interns participate in production code um, for most of their intern projects. So um, the alternative would be, you know, to come up with some sort of independent project that has its own goals and own uh, sense of success and metrics and everything. Um, but what we try to do is to actually have that those folks integrate with the rest of the team, um, operate as part of that team. So um, I think some of the I feel like that's a stronger way for my particular my particular group to have um, interns come in and get something useful and, and meaningful out of it. Um, so we have some interns here today who are working on some of our next generation headphone technologies. Um, we have other folks who have been uh, rather instrumental in getting you know uh, rendering technologies, say for the new iMac that just launched. Um, they were participating in that as well. Great. Yeah, uh, so we have quite a few interns and continue to do so in the in the research department. Um, I think some of the 
different researchers and managers maybe have a bit of a different philosophy on how to deal with the interns. Um, and so personally, I have tried to find projects that the interns can work on somewhat independently. Uh, so maybe a little bit of a different approach from Nick, but I guess the way I view that is um, it's not something that's completely unrelated to what we're doing. Usually what I find is that in research, there's tons of ideas that we want to work on. And oftentimes there are a number of them that just people don't have time to pursue. And they're, they're related to kind of larger goals that we have. And uh, so if I have an intern come in, I'll, I'll usually try to find, you know, kind of assess the intern's skill set and try to you know, kind of match one of those, those ideas to the intern's skill set to come up with something that's kind of self-contained for, you know, let's say the summer that, uh, you know, that they feel they can achieve in that period of time that is answering a question, kind of an outstanding question that we have, that, that we've been wanting to address and haven't had the time to, and is still very much related to the technology that we're working on. So uh, in my mind, that gives the intern, you know, the ability to work somewhat independently, but at the same time, work on something that's very much related to of the larger picture within research and allows them to kind of draw on the expertise of the, the researchers around them to, um, to uh, uh, you know, help with any issues that might come up. And, um, you know, it, and oftentimes the results that come out of it uh, can be useful for technologies that we're pushing forward. Uh, a specific example is, uh, I can give it one example of an intern who worked on a, uh, uh, like a, a very dense linear array of loudspeakers to look at um, beam forming as a way for rendering Atmos in a home context. That, was, that wasn't the tech that we were considering seriously for licensing at the time, but it was something we hadn't explored and we're interested in seeing the results. Um, I did some other ideas with another intern about using a kind of motion tracking systems to track a user in a listening space to see how that might be uh, employed to better uh, optimize Atmos rendering in the home. Uh, that was an example one that was maybe a little bit further looking further into the future. Uh, but again, something that the, the, the full-time employees didn't necessarily have time to pursue, but we thought would uh, produce some interesting results. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been some resulted in some really interesting collaborations and those projects have, uh, you know, given us insight as well into, you know, if the, you know, the, the person in the internship is, uh, has a skill set that seems to be to, to mesh well with the Dolby culture and, and our expectations. Thanks for that, Ellen. Just curious, since you did mention that the interns on your particular team did work on some more self-contained projects, what are some sorts of things that you look for in the resume to see if that they if they would be a good candidate to be a potential intern on your team to be able to drive some of those projects into fruition? Yeah, great question. Um, so, I mean, at least from the audio research department, you know. Up, up, some of the fundamentals we're looking for are, you know, the strong technical skills in areas like signal processing, and you know, uh, math like probability, linear algebra, um, which I would say is, you know, generally oftentimes at the at the, at the graduate level or beginning graduate school. Um, that's part of it. So you know, kind of having that core skill set to do work on some of these problems, um, but. I personally like to see, you know, people who've taken the initiative to kind of pursue, you know, their interests beyond just the, the academic coursework. So if, if they've done like an independent project that involves audio, um, you know, as part of their, their schoolwork, um, I see that as being a really good indicator that they would be a good fit here. Um, is uh, what I find for, you know, people at Dolby are often most successful when they have a real personal passion about the technologies that they're working on. It's not just, you know, uh, um, you know, we've got lots of musicians, for example, who work in the research department. You know, they, they love working on audio, not just because of the, the, like the core math behind it, because they have a true passion for the, for the subject. Thanks so much. Yeah. And Nick, I want to pass over that same question to you. What do you think makes a candidate stand out on the resume? Anything they can put on the resume? Any particular skills or types of experiences that you like to see? Something I really enjoy seeing is when someone has an opinion on something that they that they've done. So when you when you do a project for school or you have a even an independent project, um, I think a lot of times, you know, maybe the the problem sp statement or the problem space has been laid out for you, which is is great. It gives you some structure. Um, what I really like to like to see in an intern candidate is someone who's thought about that question rather deeply, thought about the implications of it. Um, 
ask questions about it, and they have an opinion on you know why their solution is the right way to go about it, um, or even the wrong way. Maybe they went through a whole you know scientific uh, method process and they were developing a project and they found out it didn't work. Well, tell me why it didn't work and tell me how you're going to improve the next time around. I really like to, like to see people who have um, who have shown a competency for not only their technical skills but their ability to retrospect, introspect, and change their approach in the future based on what they've built today. Great. Is that something that you? Oh, sorry, getting a little bit of feedback. Um, is that something that you can sort of dig for in the interview process, or is that something that they can showcase in their resume as well? I think resumes generally. I, th I think probably the more concise, the better, um, especially when you're, you're you're trying to get noticed. Um, but I think the calling out something important. Maybe you have one project that's led into another project, or if you have something independent that you've worked on showing that you've made you know uh, a release cadence so you, you know you've worked on this library that's a pet project of yours that you're passionate about and now you're on version 1.2 of that library now i know that you've done something to get from 0 0.1 to 1.2 so we can mm -hmm. we can uh, dig into that um, but our interviews do cover that as well great thank you so much um, Alan, I want to touch on something that you mentioned in your last an answer. You had mentioned that you mostly find candidates within the people who have their master's degree. Is there a preference for undergrad versus grad grad students for your internships? And can you explain a little bit why? I mean, there's no hard and fast rule about uh, um, undergraduate versus graduate, but I would say that the the types of core technical skills that we generally are looking for um, usually are are taught at the uh, at the graduate level. So, you know, most of our interns have been you know had like at least one year of their master's program under their belt, or uh, sometimes they're in the middle of a PhD program and have been in graduate school for many years. So, kind of that that range. Um, you know, uh, that being said, you know we have had some recent interns. Uh, with uh, just uh, undergraduate degrees uh, as we were looking for um, some people to work on content creation that was specific to some of the research projects. So it, it can vary. Um, but I would say in general, it's, it's uh, you know, we're looking for people for with, with, with some type of graduate degree. And that's generally the case too for hiring full time. Uh, so we would be, you know, we've, we've definitely had, you know, I've, someone working with me now who she interned uh, as she was getting her master's uh, degree and then she finished up and we fired her full time now. Great, love to hear a success story. Yeah. <laughs> um, Nick, do you have any uh, preferences for a graduate or an undergraduate for an, a role in your team? I would say, for, you know, formally, no, I don't have a, a preference. Uh, we'll consider uh, folks who are, who are in school now um, and, and as well as folks who have either you know, going on to graduate work or are just out of school in either an undergrad or graduate context or, you know, early career. Um, all of those folks are, are great, can be great candidates for the team. Um, I think one of the things that that lends our team pretty well to kind of undergrad work or, or early careers, because um, given we are an integration team, we don't necessarily need all of the um, low level algorithmic knowledge of how to develop Adobe technology, but we need you to understand how to connect those together. And that is something that I don't, I don't feel is, is uh, or I think you can be successful at that in throughout your, your studies. So um, no, I don't have a particular preference there, although I would echo Alan's statement and say, we love to try to convert interns. So if you are fresh out of college or uh, fresh out of high school or wherever it is, um, if you can show me that you've got some great experience, um, whether it's in an academic or personal environment, then that's a great step forward. And it's, that's the type of books that we look for when we're trying to convert interns to full-time. Thanks so much. For my next question, so most of the te our technical roles at Dolby are centered around either a speciali specialization in audio or vision technology. For our internships and entry level roles, how proficient should a candidate be at understanding audio concepts and theories to be considered for opportunities with your team? How deep should their understanding of the technology be? And either one of you can take that. Say, I mean, there can be quite a range there. Um, to me, a more important thing would be someone with a strong technical background and a passion for audio. And you know, maybe if they haven't 
you know, if they haven't studied the, let's say, psychoacoustics, for example, um, but they have, uh, you know, really strong signal processing background or, or mathematics chops um, and, a, you know, and a passion for audio, let's say, you know, pursuing music outside of school. I mean, that, you know, I feel that's a good combination. And, you know, uh, those other things can be learned on the job or, you know, we can, you know, work towards building those skills, um, you know, and there are certainly cases where we encounter people who do have that uh, that skill set. So, I mean, if if someone has someone is interested in Dolby and they have the opportunity to study, you know, psychoacoustics, for example, or, or, or acoustics, um, I would certainly encourage them to do so because th that skill set is definitely uh, uh, definitely been beneficial, but not required. Great. Yeah, I would say uh, fairly similar on my team. Um, my team is we have a lot of people who are passionate about music and audio. There's quite a few folks who understand audio processing very well. Um, and we, you know, to a degree, we need those specializations so that um, we can understand what we're receiving from other tech, from other teams, right? Like we're responsible for making all these things fit together. The more we know about each independent technology, we can speak to it and defend it, the easier it is for us to build a quality product. Um, but with that said, we have a couple folks who, you know, since we're writing production code, they really like the build and release process. They really like how we set up our continuous integration framework. Or maybe they're really good testers and they really like writing um, tests in PyTest, for example, or setting up automation frameworks for our hardware. Those are all also important skill sets for, for folks on my team to have. And not everyone need, is going to be the same. They're going to have different interest levels for different parts of what we do. And I think that's that's something that we're open to as well. Yeah, let me also add to that, you know, on the research side, there are definitely, well, there are some areas where I would say, you know, having the audio expertise, you know, maybe is, we wouldn't view it as being as required. So, I mean, there are some newer areas that we're looking at, for example, with deep learning, uh, where, you know, if someone's got really good core expertise or, or you know, just interest in, in, in deep learning, but hasn't, hasn't necessarily applied it to audio, you know, that's, you know, just that skill set on its own could be, you know, might be perceived as extremely valuable for a particular project where, you know, they could come in and say, oh, I've done deep learning before. Oh, now I'm going to try, you know, try applying it to audio. It should be kind of a new, a new area for them. So it, it, it you know, it, uh, maybe my, my original answer is maybe a bit biased by the particular work that I'm doing, but there are other areas within research that, that don't necessarily require, uh, you know, specific focus on audio. Got it. Thank you both so much. Um, backtracking just a little bit, both of you had mentioned the importance of personal projects on a resume. Do you have any tips for any students that are just starting out and don't really know where to start off and pursuing a personal project of their own? That's a really good question. Um, let me go first so I'm, I don't get blown away by Alan's answer. Um, uh, I would say something that I enjoy seeing the most, again, is, is someone who said, I, this thing is bugging me, whatever it is, whether it's in an academic context or in my personal context, um, this use case that I'm trying to do is just too hard. How can I make that easier? And there are a lot of really interesting libraries that other folks have put together to solve everyday problems whether it's something that's related more to like an, an, you know, an audio media context or video, or it's just something like home automation. Like there's almost an infinite number of, of uh, repos on GitHub that you could go to check out for people who have done a really good job solving some kind of technical problem. And maybe that inspires you to figure out, you know, something that's bothering you in your everyday life, or maybe you take that library and build off it and do something else. Um, there's, you know, in the case of media, there are a lot of really interesting frameworks like WebVLC or GStreamer or other um, frameworks that allow you to plug in different plugins. Um, there are interesting workflows that you can do with content creation with um, digital audio workstations or, you know, maybe you're a music producer and you, you create music. Like all of these are places to say, here's a, a problem that I've, been, I've encountered and here's some sort of programmatic way that I've solved that, issue, that problem. Thank you. Alan, do you want to try taking a stab at this question? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, kind of related to that, I mean, Nick talked about kind of solving a problem that's bugging them. Um, and I would I would kind of, that could be something that someone's passionate about. I, I would just say, you know, if, if someone, 
creates a personal project to go explore an area that they are personally really excited about. So for example, you know, if they have a, they're working in a class, you know, that is teaching them about some kind of generic, uh, let's say mathematical concept. And if they can see that, how that relates to a personal passion of theirs and then create a project around that, that uses that, that technology to help them, you know, explore that passion. Um, that to me is a, is a really good example of a, a of a personal project that I would find exciting, just to be able to see how someone can can pursue a pro, you know a topic that they have personal interest in based on the things that they're learning, because that's kind of what we're expecting people to be doing inside of our research department. Uh, our our department is not really about here's a task, go do it. I mean, when you first join, you might be assigned something like that, but as someone grows within the department, the idea is for them to be you know, coming up with new ideas on their own and developing new technologies. And my, I generally have seen those be most successful when it is, when those are developed around someone's, you know, personal interests and something that they really care about. So if I can see that in a project that they've done in school, that to me is a really good indicator that, that they can be successful in, in our department. I really, I strongly agree with that. And, and at the end, we're, we're not hiring your fingers, we're hiring you as a person. So the more that we know about you and how we can apply that at Tolby is, is really helpful. <laughs> I mean, I, I'll give it, I mean, uh, I mean, this is an example for myself, but um, like when I was an undergraduate, uh, there wasn't like any specific like electronic music uh, course, um, set of courses I could take, but you know, I had done some, had some, uh, coursework in general systems engineering and kind of in my mind was like, oh, those those are the principles that apply to how digital synthesizers work. So I created an independent program to kind of create my own, you know, uh, voice based MIDI controller for synthesizers you know, using DSP as a side project as a follow on to, you know, to the coursework that I had that wasn't specifically about that area. So um, that's, an you know, an example of something, I guess it was my own example, but that's, you know, kind of thing. That would I, I would find interesting. Great, thank you both so much for that. This next question is for Nick because I think it's a little bit more relevant to your work and your team. What are your thoughts on candidates who come from a non-traditional, non-technical background? Uh, what kinds of things would you like to see on a resume if they don't have necessarily have an undergraduate degree in CS or computer engineering? That's a great question, and. Um, We've had some of those kind of candidates before, and we 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 consider them the same as someone with a you know with a master's degree from some well-known university. I think it's I think your wife provides a lot of interesting opportunities and challenges, and everyone is is unique in that way. And there's I would love to see the way that you have taken what you have available to you and done something interesting with it. I think it goes again back to what your personal passions are. Um, you know, there's, we use a lot of C and C++. We use a lot of Python for our testing. Those are all frameworks and, and languages that um, you can get rolling with, you know, relatively, you know, a low cost PC and just a small uh, IDE to work from. You can do a lot of really cool stuff with that. So I think the, again, it just goes back to what, how did you apply what you've learned? How did you, how did you learn from what you've learned over time and everything? So if you can show me that you've, you've had a, 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 some sort of technical question and you've gone about, you know, here's your approach for going through it and here's the, you know, here's what you learn from it and here's how you change your approach in the future. Those steps are the building blocks of every great engineer. Um, and so those are the sorts of things that I wanna see reflected in a, in a resume and then reflected in your, your interview. Great, thank you. <laughs> Ellen, do you have any thoughts? Just wanted to ask. Apologize. I missed the very first part of the question, like the the, the, the subject part, guys. I, I got distracted by a QA question that popped up. Could, if you just wanted to, and I'm trying no to. No worries. Yeah, I was just wondering <laughs> if you have any thoughts on people, folks who come from a non-traditional, non-technical background, and something that might make them stand out. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I I guess it would be. Uh, similar to what Nick said, you know, sh showcasing that they have been able to solve interesting and challenging problems and, you know, pursue those problems on their own, you know, 
you know, outside of the, the traditional channels. And, you know, if, if someone has produced some really interesting technical results, uh, you know, working on their own or another company, but they don't have the traditional educational background, that is definitely something we would still consider. Great, thanks so much. And I'll go over to the question in the Q&A chat now. Question from Dina, what are the major red flags for you as you go through applications? What huge mistakes can we tell students to avoid when applying for jobs or internships? Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm trying to think of times when I've looked at a resume and then said no, just based on like a red flag. So um, I might need a moment to ruminate on that. But I think uh, when we go through applications, it's again, it's not just the the number. Like the GPA is good, but if I if I if I see um, either very limited project work or limited application, um, you know, just a, a just seeing that you took a, a number of courses and you did well in them, that's great. Um, but I want to see that next level. I want to see something that's, you know, there's a, here's a, Git, a link to my GitHub where I have some projects that I worked on um, through school or on my own. Um, and I want to see that, again, like for, at least for me, like I prefer a shorter, more concise um, resume to the extent that you can. I don't want to see every single project because that tells me you haven't prioritized what has been the most valuable to you, the things that you can defend and speak to in depth. So um, maybe those things, some of those things are interesting, but um, really show me that you've curated your resume and shown me the strongest parts of yourself. Thanks. I can also add to that a little bit. So for the resumes that I've screened through, I think it's really important that students are aware of the role that they're actually applying to because the job qualifications listed on there are actually kind of important. So if the job lists a specific language that a student should have, then they should have that on the resume. Otherwise, it won't get to the hiring manager and it'll stop at the recruiter. Um, so at the very bare minimum, making sure that they have relevant experience uh, that is outlined in the job description that they can refer. Great. Um, yeah, if I were to comment on this this question, I, again, it would be hard for me to come up with a like a red flag, but it, it's similar to what Nick said, um, if someone's resume is just kind of the listing out, here's the coursework I did, my GPA, um, and that's kind of where it stops. I mean, I, it's something you'd look at, but it's not as interesting as if you see someone who has those qualifications, but also has the addition of, yeah, here are some projects here that I've worked on that are related to these you know, personal areas of interest. Um, and, you know, something in the resume to kind of, uh, you know, communicate you know, what they're really passionate about. Hey, Amy, I actually, I want to bounce that back to you for a second. We have just two minutes left. So if someone's coming from a, a background where they don't have as much technical depth or technical experience in a, in a um, conventional framework, how can they set up a resume or set up their application process to still be get noticed? Yeah, I think with, ooh, sorry, I think with people or folks that are coming from non-traditional backgrounds, I think there is a little bit more legwork that they will be required to do to sort of get their foot in the door. So a lot of that legwork could be like the personal projects that you had mentioned, if they're taking any classes or LinkedIn courses, I think putting those on your resume will actually help as well. Because if we just see your major from an undergrad degree and it's not relevant, then that doesn't give you very much credibility. So just showing that you've done some of the legwork, the bare minimum and showing any other qualifications that you can highlight on your resume, I think would give you a better chance. And wanted to add one last thing to that last question from Dina. Um, we see a lot of students put their complete address on their resumes, but I don't think that's necessary anymore. And for their own protections, I think it's a better idea to keep your address off of your resume, your physical address, and just include the city and state that you're located in for just for a <laughs> small note. OK, um, since we have about one minute left, I want to ask, what is one thing that a student should absolutely take away about learning from in their learning about Dolby, um, in your opinion? If they were to take away one thing from this entire event or anything that they should know about Dolby, what is one thing that they should know? First, um, I would say 
I mean, you heard, I mean, Alan, both Alan and myself have been here for upwards of a decade. Um, and we're here, at least speaking just for myself then, um, we're here because we're just, we're still excited about what Dolby does. And Dolby, we're a year into the pandemic and Dolby is still doing great because we've got really incredible people and we've got our priorities straight for long-term growth and success and everything. So I've always felt like this is a place if, if you can, you know, if you're, you're giving us your best, um, we've got great job security. We've got less, we've got more of the sense of less role security, meaning we expect you to learn new things. We expect you to grow with the company. And we have this great long roadmap of awesome, awesome technology coming out that really delights people when it, when it comes to market. Yeah, I'll add that I would just say that you know, we really value people who are passionate and believe in the technologies that they're working on, because that's the attitude that we think results in great new things coming out, coming up at the company. Thank you both so much for your time and for all of your helpful answers. And thanks to everyone in the audience for joining our session here today. So this marks the end of our Dolby sessions here at the Education Summit 2021. Thanks everyone and hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions going on later today with CSUEA.